We return to the story of Angela Jones, a woman caught in a catch-22. With no job and no insurance, can she get the treatment she needs for her breast cancer? Well, you're about to see how innovative research and community care combine to give us a better understanding of one person's cancer crisis and how she's coping. Arriving at the West Clinic in Midtown Memphis, Angela and her sisters get ready for the visit that will likely take all day. As usual, the clinic is full. She's not the only one going through a life and death battle. Who that patient was that you were telling me that I'm supposed to see today? Well into her day at 10.30 a.m., Dr. Blakely has already seen 10 patients. Angela is next. Hey, hey. how are you? Fine, that's fine, that's fine. Come here, give me a hug. Okay. You doing all right? I'm doing good. How are you? Well, uh, like I said, I have a little allergy, so what's going to say? Well, sit down. She's truly a trooper, and every time I go in there, she's smiling and happy, and really it's a bright spot in the day. Angela's treatment has been different from the typical surgery first, then chemo regimen. So Angela's treatment is a little bit different because her tumor is still in place. In this situation where we're concerned that we may not be able to get a good margin um, because it sits close to the chest wall and where it's located, we may consider chemotherapy before um, surgery. The goal of this type of treatment is to use a combination of chemotherapy drugs to shrink the tumor down to a manageable size for surgical removal. The cool thing about the neoadjuvant chemotherapy is that after they have surgery, a lot of times the tumor may be in fact completely dead, and so we feel really good about ourselves after that. Based on today's visit, Angela is now ready to enter the next phase of chemotherapy. She's getting a regimen called dose-dense chemotherapy. And so she's finished her four courses of adriamycin cytoxin, her hair's all fallen out, and she's done beautifully. You're so funny. <laughs> Crack me up. No, you crack me up. <laughs> no, it's just you laugh when you get nervous. And you laugh all the time. That's what it is. Okay. <laughs> the goal of this particular type of treatment is to eradicate the cancer while conserving as much healthy breast tissue as possible. But without insurance, this seems like an impossibility for Angela. Dr. Blakely doesn't see it that way. I don't care if they have insurance or not. My job is not to care. My job is to give them the medicine if they need it. If they don't have insurance, though? If they don't have insurance, we still see them, and we work with them. And then we use um, drug replacements or from the drug companies, and we try to do workarounds. A bill for chemotherapy and all the stuff that we do could be upwards of $100,000. If they can't afford their t insurance for a 20% copay, they're not going to be able to afford $20,000. We've made it so patients can get chemotherapy in the clinic and they don't have to go to the hospital. Another type of research into the genetic causes of cancer may help Angela. There's something increasing the risk. Yes, ma'am. But if we can identify what's caused your cancer and see that some people haven't inherited it, then there might be some people that don't need increased screening. I can tell you that any of my patients that are less than 40 years old who have cancer of any kind, I have them talk with our genetic counselor, whether or not they have family history or not, just because if you're less than 40, you're not supposed to get cancer. That's really unusual. And I think it helps to have a genetic counselor just look at that so that if you are planning to have children later, um, you know, you, you ha you're armed with some information. The genetic counselor compiles a cancer history of Angela's family. Based on the interview, Angela may be invited to participate in a study. That would allow her health to be monitored for any future cancer recurrences. Why don't you sign here just in case that you're the responsible party for billing, but I checked here okay. that you're applying to the hardship program. Yes, ma'am. For Angela, the message is simple. Take responsibility for your health. I mean, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, it's going to get even worse. That's what I say. So <laughs> it just so happened I caught mine. I just was just, you know, doing my monthly breast examination. I caught it. Like I said, it's just, it's not the discrimination. As you can see, politicians, wives, and politicians out there is also getting all this. So, yeah. There's no discrimination. So. And though personal responsibility is key to fighting cancer, our next story shows just how important it is to have the support of caregivers. Good morning. Good morning. How are y'all doing? We're doing yeah, pretty good. How about you? Doing good. Sheila Flynn is a patient of Dr. Bradley Summer at the West Clinic location in South Haven, Mississippi. Two years ago, she was diagnosed with lymphoma. Throughout the ordeal, her husband Paul never left her side. We're just uh, together all the time. 
when we can. Uh, we sit together there in the house and uh, we are always holding hands. Both widowed, Sheila and Paul had met at a support group for single parents 20 years ago. They were instantly drawn to one another. I think the first time I saw him, I just thought he was the grandest and he was one man I wanted. <laughs> I got him. <laughs> they instantly knew they wanted to build a life together, literally. We like to build, create. We love furniture, antiques, and things like that. We've made fences. Paul was with Sheila every step of the way. But soon came a cruel twist of fate. Just days after Sheila's last treatment, Paul began having problems. Hey, look, I'm about ready to pull these things off. I am just about ready to go crazy on them. Caregiver soon became the patient. It started when Paul began having headaches. He thought it was sinuses. And uh, we went to the doctor and we told him, you know, something's just not right. So he sent him to the hospital for MRI. While waiting at home for results, Paul collapsed. Sheila took him back to the hospital immediately. When the doctor came in, he looked at Paul and he asked him who he was. And he said, my name is Sheila. Well, Sheila is my name. And I says, no, honey, your name is Paul. Right away, the physician located the results of Paul's MRI. He went back there to check. And that's when he found out. He came back and he told us, I shouldn't have to be the one to tell you this, but your husband has a tumor on the brain. I mean, my world is turned upside down. I mean, I was shocked. One physician told Paul he had nine months to live, while another told Sheila another number. She said 18 to 24 months. And I thought, gosh, they're giving him more time. I mean, it's as if the doctors have given him time, and that's not really what it was. This kind of numbers game isn't always in the best interest of the patient. It may be a few days, it may be a few weeks, or it may be six or eight months. But I never want them to leave me and start counting their days. I never want to go, I never say to them, you're going to live two months, because they'll go home and start marking off those 60 days. That's just not my role, and it's not, I don't know, you know, so I, and that's not fair to them, you know, that's because I don't know. And so many physicians, so many people in healthcare do that. Go home and get your affairs ready. Well, we should all get our affairs ready. Who knows what's going to happen to us tomorrow? You're not going to the good Lord gets ready for you. So that's, the, that's been our attitude. We're living each day and trying to put our whole world into that one day. And so far, it's worked. You've been doing well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think he has. So. Uh, his, gotta... his memory kind of runs a little bit, but not any worse than it was. Nothing different than last time? No, I can't tell this any different. He le loses track of the days, like he, you know, he'll wake up on Saturday and wants to call the city hall to pick up trash in front of the house. And I said, no, they're not open. And I tell him the, the day. But I'm now I'm circling the calendars and letting him know which day. That helps, too. But mm -hmm. for the most part, I think that he's done real well. The only thing that I have, I have a question about, and this may seem silly, um, is that I, I, I tend to want to just... I will say push myself, but is that a, a problem? Do I need do I need, need to watch it because of well, the medicine? Well, depends on what kind of thing that you're doing. Well, well how about yeah. trying to get his saw out and saw some rubbery back? I mean, what, do what you can do, but don't do anything. Don't overdo it. Don't don't operate when I machinery. see, yeah, like the oh. Oh. chainsaw, I told chainsaw, him, no, yeah. that, that, that yeah. doesn't work with you. Yeah. But, that was, but that was fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh. <laughs> fun to you and me weary. <laughs> But you know, we have some great times together. Even going through this, you push it. You have to, as a survivor of cancer, push it out of your mind. You can't sit around and give up. You cannot. It just shows that, that you really can live a life despite your cancer diagnosis. Even though you're fighting it, even though you've got to go through all the treatments, and even though you've got to come back to doctors, it, it's not going to get you down. It's just inspiring to see that, uh, that they're not going to let, let it get them down, despite, any, despite all odds. Sheila and Paul's journey together has not been an easy one, but it has given each of them an opportunity to truly love and support one another and to give each other hope. We are all reminded every day that the reality of cancer is not everyone survives. Paul Flynn lost his battle with brain cancer. 
I feel honored to have met him and our thoughts and prayers are with his wife Sheila and their family.